one else but you. Father, you are the chief bishop and shepherd of our souls. We anchor ourselves in you right now. Lord, wash us afresh through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Make us ready and fit vessels to be used by you in this hour. We make the declaration, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let this word go forward, O oh God, far and wide. Let sinners and saints alike repent and turn back to you. Let our hearts be washed afresh, Lord God Almighty. Let us begin anew with you in this season. For you're asking of us, my God, to come to the place of change and transformation that your program for the church, the bride of our Lord Jesus Christ, be readied for his return. We don't want to miss you, Father. Oh, God Almighty. So we place ourselves before you afresh. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Please be seated. It's my absolute pleasure to come to you this morning. And Bishop has left us for a short while to be a church on the rock as he ministers this morning in their anniversary service. He will return for the memorial service of our beloved Reverend Orville Ramakan at 11.30. But I want to give God thanks for each of you. You have made it out this morning. You have pressed against time to be in Father's presence and I know that God will not disappoint you. Amen. To those who are watching us online, welcome in the presence of the Lord. Special welcome to my elder sister, Persia. You have been such an instrumental person in my life. You're one of the persons why I serve the Lord with vigor and vitality. Your love has really nurtured many of us over the years. And I thank God for you. I want to use a special time to extend my love to you, Persia, the Costa. Love you, love you, love you. This morning I want to speak a little on plague, sword, and altar. Plague, sword, altar. I know I have to be short, so let's go. All men have flaws. Men of low degrees have flaws. Even great men carry within themselves deadly flaws. So much so that except God, or except for God, we would all be annihilated from the earth. Some men hide their flaws very well. For some it is not so easy. I believe God always takes us to the point where we can face our challenges and confront our flaws so that he can take it from us for our good. Say amen. amen. I want God 
to challenge me, to take my flaws from me. If he doesn't do it, then I would be a castaway after a while. I don't want to be a castaway. And I know that you don't want to be a castaway. Praise God, praise God. Intercessors just get into the place of prayer. And I don't mind, Lady Marsha, if you come to the front. Thank you, Jesus. Since character flaws, weaknesses, are really sins of the heart. A loving God will not give us a passing grade when he has made provision for us to deal with sin. Say amen. I want to do that again. Since character flaws, weaknesses are really sins of the heart, a loving God will not give us a passing grade when he has made provision for us to deal with sin. Many of us want God to give us a passing grave, but he can't and he won't. Because as Sister Yvette read this morning, God cannot lie. God is truth. He has no darkness in him. Turn your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 24. And because we want to condense or shorten, I'm going to just read quickly and then we'll take off from there. 2 Samuel, Samuel chapter 24. I'm going to pick up at verse 10. David was conscience stricken. David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men. David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, O oh Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to God, the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So God went to David and said to him, Shall there come upon you three years of famine? in your land or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you or three days of plague in your land now then think it over and decide how i should answer the one who sent me david said to god i am deeply distressed let us fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is great but do not let me fall into the hands of men Amen King David conducted a census of his army oh God the fighting men of Israel. On the face of it, this looks like a good thing. Who would not do this? That's where we are now. Nations and their armies' leadership know with accuracy and precision what the numbers are of their fighting foe, of their fighting men. Yet in this case, concerning King David, we find this account in 1 Samuel 24. It says again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he incited David against them saying, go and take a census of Israel and Judah. That is 2 Samuel 24 verse 1. Sorry. 
Another account in the book of Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 1, don't go there. It says that it was Satan that moved David's heart to the numbering of the people. We also see in the book of Exodus 30 verse 12, where the laws were put down by God concerning the numbering of the army of Israel. In short, it was up to the Lord to command a county. And if David counted, he should only do so at God's command and to receive a ransom money to atone for the county. In this account, there was no ransom money that was taken for the lives of the army. King David's chief commander, Joab, advised the king against numbering the army. The king's other captains advised against it, but they were all overruled by the king's command. After nine months, it was revealed that the size of the army was approximately 1.3 million. What was the reason behind David's counting of the army? Was the king's weakness that of pride? Was his desire that of conquering a neighboring territory and thus wanted to know if he could do it successfully? Was he just egotistical? Had he seen the prosperity of the nation under his reign and wanted to pat himself on the shoulders? Was it a sort of vain glory on the part of the people as well? For they too had pushed God to the back of their minds. And scripture shows us over and over again that when the people of God goes into idolatry and forget God, God always use something to bring their attention back to Him. God, G-A-D, God the prophet comes to the king. Oh, for prophets to intervene. God's man hearing accurately from God and being bold enough to speak to authority. That is what we want in this season of our lives. Men and women of God who are not afraid to speak to authority and say, thus say the Lord and be accurate at it. Say, Amen. Amen. That's what we want in our season. We don't want just people to come and say, thus say the Lord, when it is their own soul realm doing the talking. We want the real rhema from the mouth of the Lord. Say with me, we want accurate prophets. Yes, we want accurate prophets. Thank you, Jesus. So God came to the king. Three choices, O oh king. Pick one, my God. What a God. How judgment must be meted out to sin. How drastic must sin be dealt with. Seven years of famine. Flee three months before your enemies. Or three days plague in your land. My God. I wouldn't want to choose none of the above. Not the famine. Not the war. Not the plague. Not the famine. Not the war. Not the pestilence. Not the famine. Not the war not the plague but the king had to make a choice the king had to make a choice 
So the king makes the choice. The choice is stated. He chose three days of plagues. I'm going to run through this part of this presentation very quickly. So you just have to catch it by the spirit. Plagues. The earth has seen many seasons and plagues, many seasons and times of plagues. Plagues were in the Old Testament times and also in the New Testament times. We have seen plagues in the last 200 years and now in our recent time we have a plague on our hand. God used plagues in the past as a consequence of disobedience and idolatry. In the book of Exodus chapter 32 from verse 25 it spoke about the plagues of the Lord upon Egypt. The plague of of blood that God inflicted upon the Egyptians and this plague of blood represented covenantal breach Exodus 7 14 to 24 covenantal breach I want you to listen very clearly what I'm saying after I speak of the plague the second the plague of fraud God was fighting with the aquatic species of the land. Exodus chapter 8. Uh, the third plague, the plague of gnats or lies. Exodus 8. Uh, uh, this particular plague could not be replicated by Pharaoh's magicians. They came out of the dust and they came upon the people and the livestock. The earth itself was rejecting man. The other plague was the plague of flies. Exodus 8. It was a reminder of the lies of the enemies. God used flies. Ah, oh, Shataya. A dense swarm of flies. Exodus 8. To terrorize uh, the Egyptians, the plague of flies. Then he used the plague or oh, on the livestock. He attacked uh, Egypt's wealth. Exodus chapter 9. Then there was the plague of boils. Exodus 9. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, soot from the furnace was scattered over the land. And then the plague came upon the land. This was a sign of the unholiness of the people. Boils afflicted the Egyptians and the animals. My God, my God, this was the plague of boils. Then there was the plague of hail. God fought from the heavens. Exodus chapter 9 the plague. Hallelujah. God used hail, thunder, and lightning upon Egypt. Then the eighth plague was the plague of the locust swarm. Exodus chapter 10. God attacked the food supply of Egypt. He stripped the vegetation bare. My God. Then there was the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. Exodus 10, confusion oh, came upon Egypt. If this was the rejection of the light of God's word. Uh, everywhere there was darkness. And then the last plague was the plague of death on the firstborn of Egypt. Exodus 11. This was where God transferred the wealth of Egypt into the hands of the Israelites. My God, death came upon the house of the enemy. 
upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon the firstborn of the land. God is no stranger to plagues. I know I ran through that very quickly. Our times call for spiritual accuracy. Say that back to me. Our times call for spiritual accuracy. How many of us are deeply inquiring of the Lord? What is happening to us? I mean, what is happening now? How many of us are inquiring of the Lord? Lord, what is happening to us? I know you are. I am, I am asking the Lord, Lord, what is happening? What is happening? This is the cry over the nations. Lord, what is happening? We are all in the midst of this plague. In fact, one of the highest forms, it is called a pandemic. That means it is not confined to one little geographical area. It is all over the world. It is not just one nation, no, where you can say it is those people down there. You can't say it is black people. It is worldwide. Every time there was a plague in the Bible, there was a cause for it. I'm going to ask you to think. Every time there was a plague in the Bible, remember the word of God is written for our admonition. It is written for us to take our cues. It is written for us so that we may know how to structure our lives. My God. Every time there was a plague in the Bible, there was a cause for it. Every time there was a plague, God knew about it. Some very simple things this morning. God knew about it. Every time there was a plague, God knew about it. Say Amen. So what is missing here? How come we are not asking ourselves more questions? Say with me, how come? Come on, man. How come? And how come the spiritual precedence is being so easily overlooked when we have it right here in the Word of God before us? The act of taking the census was David's decision. He wanted to know the number of his fighting force. The act of sending the plague was God's decision. Say yes. Say yes. A punishment on the king as well as on the people. But I want you to look Keenly with me at verse 10, 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 10. It says David was conscience stricken. So after the nine months had passed, the, the soldiers, Joab, and the other captains of the army had gone around the entire country to number the fighting force. Afterwards, the Bible says, David's heart pricked him. He was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. I am conscience stricken. I am going somewhere. Conscience is a term that describes an aspect of a human being's self-awareness. This is in quotation mark because I'm speaking this that somebody else has written. Conscience is a term that describes an 
aspect of a human being's self-awareness. It is part of a person's internal rational capacity that bears witness to the norms and values we recognize and apply. Consequently, there is always a sense of struggle in our reflective process. I am going somewhere. The witness of conscience makes its presence known by inducing mental anguish and feelings of guilt when we violate the values we recognize and apply. Conscience also provides a sense of pleasure when we reflect on conformity to our value system. The Bible says after David had done what he did in taking the census, he was conscience stricken. Where is this capacity in our modern world? Where is this capacity in our modern world? Believers, we are dealing with people now who seem to have no conscience at all. My God, my God. No conscience. We are dealing with people who have no conscience. How can a man murder a mother and then turn around and murder the children in the house? How can a man murder not only one, two, three, four people? How can a mass shooter take up a gun, enter a school, and shoot babies? And they're not conscious. Where is man's conscience? Where has our conscience gone take it home right here to yourself when we sin why does not our conscience prick us my God mm. men's capacity to reflect on any inner witness of right and wrong is just not there anymore it's a problem and we have it inside of our churches as well as outside now i expect it outside we don't expect it inside but men have lost their conscience inside Oh, for a people to cry out, Oh God, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Each man wants to point the finger at the other and refuse to acknowledge sin. I am wrapping up. This refusal is at the heart of a seared conscience. S-E-A-R-E-D A seared conscience A word used by the Apostle Paul In 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.2 To mean a dulled conscience Dulled to the sense of right and wrong Desensitized to moral pangs Or rendered insensitive So a person with a seared conscience is past feeling that something like lying is wrong. A seared conscience is like a conscience that has a hot iron being put to it. So you can no longer feel that something is wrong. That's a seared conscience. The king cried out, Now, O oh Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. My God, the psalm that was read this morning 
is so much in line with where we want to go today. Oh Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. We are not too big saints of the living God to make that cry to God. My God. Oh Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. This brokenness in the face of wrongdoing, this level of penitence, this sensitivity to turn one's heart to God must be the mark of true believers in this hour. It starts with you and it starts with me. Penitence of heart, brokenness of mind to ask for forgiveness for God. Our hearts have gotten too proud and stout. And we don't want to get to the place where our conscience are seared. How will others see the pattern if we don't model it for them? How can the world know how to repent and have brokenness of heart if we don't model it in the house of God? My Lord, my God. How then will God's hand of mercy come upon us afresh and turn the tide of COVID-19 away from us? How will God turn away punishment from us if we don't cry out to God for mercy? If we do not love repentance and brokenness of heart and mind? If we are not sensitive in our spirit to ask God for forgiveness? It is obvious that God wants us to see Jesus. Jesus Christ is God's answer of mercy to us. Jesus Christ is still God's answer to a dying world. To a world suffering under the palms of COVID-19. Jesus Christ is still the answer. My God, have we taken God for granted? Haven't we waved our sins before God and wear them as a badge of honor? My God, my God, you will never understand, we will never understand the depth of God's mercy until we acknowledge and feel the weight of sinfulness, darkness and evil and transgression. And the only way we can feel this weight of transgression so that we turn from sin is that we have a broken and a contrite heart. Amen. God is after our heart this morning. Look across at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is after your heart. The king says, said, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated, and 70,000 of the people died. My God. Oh, Jesus. 70,000 thousand of the people die. So now here we are and thousands of our people are dead worldwide. Much more than 70,000. Much more than 70,000. So what are we saying? Come on saints, let us stand now. Let us stand up. Let us stand. I'm closing up. I'm closing. Verse 14 says, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall 
into the hands of men. My God. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. Say with me now, this is our prayer unto the Lord. Lord, we are in deep distress. Say, Lord, we fall into your hands. Oh, Lord, we place ourselves squarely into your hands. Oh, Lord, your mercy is great. You are making intercession now for us here in Jamaica and for the nations of the earth. Say with me, oh Lord, oh Lord. your mercy is great. Mercy is great. Oh, Lord. oh Lord, call back, call back. The, angel the angel of death from the nations the nation. of the earth. Of the earth. Oh, Lord. oh Lord, call back, call back. The, angel the angel of death, death. from the nations. the nations. Call back, oh God, the angel of death. Upgrade. 
your prior level. What will it cost you? That is what God is saying to you this morning. I'm finished. But what will it cost you? What will it cost you to turn your heart to the Lord? What will it cost us to have that heart before God? So we can hear God speaking to us when we do miss the mark. This may not be a popular message, but it is a necessary message. Yes, God. It is necessary because God wants you to stand in the gap for others. So the conscience stricken, that penitence of the heart, when we when we recognize sin in ourselves, that's where we go first. Then we can plead for the nations. For this is the time of pleading for the nation. But it begins with us first. With ourselves. Bringing ourselves to the altar of God. My God. Where we can join in with a level of intercession that God wants us to do for the nations of the earth. But it will cost you something. This is not a money message as many have made it out to be. This is absolutely not a money message. For you can give a million dollars if you have it. But then your heart is not broken and so you cannot make the intercession. You cannot go to that level with God. God is after your heart this morning. Right where you are. Right where you are. Make it an altar. Make it an altar to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say to God, I'm coming back to you, Lord. I'm forsaking my sin. That sin that has overtaken me. That sin that has displeased you, Father God. That sin that you have spoken to me many times about. But I've gone on in my ways. Lord, I make it to your altar this morning. Give me a right spirit to be broken before you. Let the weight of my sin come upon my conscience. Let the weight Come upon my conscience. Help me, Lord, to be able to discern right from wrong. And help me to acknowledge sin in my heart. Help me now to apply the remedy of the blood of Jesus to my heart. To walk away free from guilt and stay. I want to be a new creature, a new man. A new woman in Christ. Thank you, Lord. 
for meeting me at the altar. I know it cost you everything at Calvary when you saw the death of your son. Hallelujah. Lord, I will give you nothing less than 100% of my heart. My soul belongs to you, God. Now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord extend the scepter of righteousness to you and grant you his shalom. Shalom, shalom, shalom. In Jesus' name, amen.